Welcome back to another episode of The Ungrown Ups. This is episode number eight, or as we call it, The Ocho. We're about to get crazy with, I don't know what the hell we're getting crazy with. I guess we're just crazy in this room. So we started chatting before we started hitting the record button, and then we said, hey, let's let's get some of this down on uh, on SD card, on tape, yeah. on file. Most of our, our really good stuff happens without the record button on. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of the way you sh- life should be. You don't want it all staged, I guess. No, you don't want to record. But the conversation, yeah. That's what I mean, just conversation-wise, right? We end up having talks about whatever it is, and then we go back Whatever life is going and, on, yeah. yeah. And so <laughs> one of the, the challenges that I'm facing is, I'm 40, which is fine, but I have... Is it, though? Eh, it's fine. It, nothing seems different yet. By the way, really quick, the uh, I want to welcome you to your sixth decade that you're participating. I know. I know. After the uh, New Year's post, I saw a lot of stuff on social media. So yeah. I was around for the 70s, 80s, 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s, and now... And I, I didn't even think about it until, uh, I guess it was New Year's Eve, or some New Year's day morning-ish. I woke up at like 3 a.m. with that thought. I went, wait a minute, what the heck? That and then nice. I saw it somewhere later. One of my friends mentioned it and was like, I had that exact same thought. Six decades. Yeah. How'd you get a participation trophy of some type? Just imagine the uh, the variety of music that we've experienced in those decades. We started with disco. Yeah. It. I don't think so. Turning forty didn't make me feel old. What right. made me feel old was a couple of years ago when the DJ was talking about the Nirvana Nevermind album being twenty five years old. Yeah, and it has now since been passed, so it's older than twenty five years old. But that, I think, was kind of the wake up call and going, "Oh shit, I've been around for a while." Right. And in in Southern California, there's a um, a popular radio station called K Earth. Uh, it's a one hundred one FM. That is our oldie station. It's no longer oldies. They play stuff from the 90s and 2000s and stuff. But growing up as but a it kid, is the oldies it station. was the oldies station. And I don't know how they've rebranded themselves, but they're playing Nirvana. They're playing Foo Fighters. Right. They're playing but stuff. That, that my point is, that's now the oldies. Yeah, I know. I, mean, I, I hate to say it, and it's it's sucks, but it's true. I, I'm looking forward to like the, uh, the evening... Like what is it the the love songs like the evening hour dedications yeah we call them and when it starts getting to that we're like yeah I'd like to dedicate uh, Cisco's thong song to the love of my life right now so that was Jeanette the first, if that was you're the first song we got down to if like you're that. yeah yeah if yeah. you're listening out there Jeanette this one's for you you know oh, and that's fantastic dumps like a truck truck <laughs> truck but I mean those are going to be oldies for somebody and have yeah. some significant emotional tie to them but no no. The, the challenging part for me of, of turning older is I have uh, ear piercing. So my, my ears are gauged. They're not very large. <laughs> but the challenge is finding tasteful jewelry to replace them with. For the longest time, I had um, carbon fiber tunnels. So my ears are uh, gauged at 8 gauge, which is roughly a 3.2 millimeter hole in my ear. Not huge. I can't put my fist through it or anything like that. But I'm so glad. Yeah. Yeah. I know sometimes that you go walk around, you see people with huge, like they can put a Coke can through their ear and you're like, that's impressive. Yeah. I had, uh, mine are mostly closed. I got lucky, but I was a zero for a while. Right. So that's, it gets a little ridiculous. You can put a pen through there. Right. And so I'm looking at jewelry and the hard part is, is finding something tasteful that a 40 something year old could wear. Cause everything out there seems to be either too, I guess granola hippie kind of hemp related yeah. or it's just boring, like a, a simple hoop. And I'm trying to find stuff that would be somewhat interesting. I mean, even maybe like a, a carbon fiber nut and bolt, something more technical, more refined, probably a lot of weed related stuff. Yeah. A little yeah. happy faces yeah. or, or pot leaves and yeah. stuff like that. And it's a market that just doesn't exist, but it's kind of interesting because I'm doing all these Google searches looking at, and you, you're trying to type in different keyword searches, hoping that you hit what you're looking for. Well, I mean, what are you searching? Classy body piercing old? No. So I'm doing like, like eight, mature. eight gauge, you know, ear jewelry or body jewelry or tunnel or plug or all these. And these body piercing sites that sell these jewelry um, or that have jewelry stores online are all <laughs> crap. And so it's, it's almost impossible to find this. And it's kind of like, do I just move on from the I, jewelry thing? Maybe. 
or maybe it's a, a business opportunity. Yeah. But I, the thing is, is like, I don't know how big that market is. Right. I mean, it, it, I guess in this day and age with, with being able to do like 3d printing with metal, like doing like titanium or additive materials yeah. and stuff, maybe you could do something to where you could just have on demand services and be a pretty able, expensive investment though for that. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, going into like a, a, a manufacturing of, of body jewelry that I would think would be interesting is I, I don't know what that market is, but that's kind of the point that's, this is like, I guess the first real challenge where like everything that's out there is either too tacky or it's, it, it's simply, it's, it's just not for me, but I don't know if it's necessarily not for me because of I'm now older or if it's just not for me because it never really was. And I just found stuff over the years that I was able to use, but now I can't find those anymore. I don't know. They've got, I mean, there's gotta be just simple stuff though. Right. I mean, that would sort of, I guess, fall into the category of, yeah, I, I don't know what it is. I mean, everything I look for, it, it ends up being like glass or stone or wood plugs that are yeah. meant to be like the size of like a quarter. Like if I had a larger opening in the sure. ear and because my ear openings, I guess, are dainty in comparison, maybe I just don't have as many options. Dainty. Yeah, dainty. It's a good word. Well, I mean, it's it's a, a little over a three millimeter hole. It's not massive by sure. any means. Sure. So I, I, I don't know what that challenge is, but at the same time, it's like, I don't know where I should be looking at. Like, I don't know if it, the online search simply isn't where I should be. And I just need to be going into to more, store. yeah, more yeah. boutiques and, and stores looking for that kind of stuff. Or if it's a matter of reaching out to a, a jewelry maker and commissioning something as a one-off. Like, I, I don't know. I have no idea. Either. And I think that was part of kind of what I guess led me to just let mine sort of close up is that everything was kind of ridiculous once you wanted to like have some type of i don't know not not professional but you know you you're in a different environment and everything else was very much like stood out too much right and, and i think that's that's the thing is it you want something that is interesting but not obnoxious right and that is seemingly an impossible task with what's out there in the market these days like i don't need a fluorescent green silicone plug in my ear so yeah. it's like mm. so that that has been my your old kind of wake up call at least with the with the shopping uh trying to find some replacements from there and i'm sure i'll find something at some point but the uh the online searches that i've been doing on this for the past week or so have not yielded anything worthwhile well maybe somebody out there will know something and they can help you out yeah yeah if if that person exists send me a note send a send me an email to uh, matthew at ungrownups.com and hopefully i can find something that'll that'll adorn my ears yeah, that would be helpful. My my old thing was we already talked about was the decade thing. Just realizing that at forty years old, I'm in my sixth decade. And but I barely God. made it into the seventies. I was born two weeks before the seventies ended. Yeah, I mean, I got six months. It's yeah. not like I was a huge amount of time. But you still start to say, okay, I, I participated in. Yeah. I, and and now you know eighties, nine, like to your point, and that's 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 a lot. It makes you feel kind of old. The six decades definitely makes you feel older because you just automatically assume 60 years. And in our right. case, it's no, it's just barely over 40. But right. yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And I, the, the one thing that I've seen a lot of on social media since the, the New Year's happened has been, you know, we're closer or we're just as far from 2050 as we are from 1990. Yeah, which is, to be honest with you, doesn't do anything for me. Yeah, but so for some people, that's, that's mind-blowing. And I've seen other ones like, oh, you know, if you take the... When the one D years aired, in in reference to the time period of the sixties, if the one years if a if a modern version of the one years one D years was to air today, yeah, it would be set in like the nineties or something like that. Or we had that. It was called the seventies show, and then they had the eighties show, and it was a huge flop. Yeah, the closest thing to the eighties show now that I've actually been getting into is the the Goldbergs. I love that show. That show is awesome. It I, is I, hilarious, I, and I've been enjoying all of the eighties cameos. Yeah, with actual people from the '80s, so like Rick right. Springfield, or or various actors, or movie plots have been incorporated quite nicely into various episodes. And since that's been on Hulu, we've just been streaming all through those. And I think it's cool if you watch to the end too. He pulls up his own family, his real family. That's videos, the crazy and they part. some of that. That's super cool. Yeah. So the I guess he's the showrunner, Adam F. Goldberg. Yeah. A lot of this is based on his real family. So right. the characters that are in the episode are are basically named and modeled after his real family. And they do a lot of 
interactive stuff. So after the episode airs or after the episode is done, the little teaser or whatever, they'll, they'll chat with the real live uh, Goldberg or uh, sometimes they'll have cameos. So like um, some of the settings in a high school. So sometimes somebody comes to the school and talks and that the person, that actor in real life was the real gym coach or whatever it was. When it's narrated, like if the, the narrator is Patton Oswalt and you've got, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, Jeff Car Jeff Gar Jeff Garland. Jeff Garland is yeah, the dad. He's the dad. Yeah. So the cast is really good. Yeah. Uh, really, really funny. So we, yeah, that, that I think is the closest to the eighties, nineties show for us. Of I guess that is sort of the, the wonder years of our generation, but not as poignant. I mean, yeah. it's way, it's way funnier. It's definitely more of a comedy and less of a, a drama. Right. Right. Like the wonders years was right. But yeah, so that, that was kind of the, the, uh, that's the, I'm old statement, but that's only in, in terms of trying to find stuff. And otherwise I don't feel any older mentally. Well, you're only a few weeks into 40. Give it some time. Yeah. Yeah. You think in like two months in you'll, is that when you felt it? I think I started feeling it at like 37. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, no, I honestly, I, in, in all reality, while I feel physically, yeah, it's definitely tell I'm a little bit older, but mentally I'm still like 17. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that ever changes and that I hope I'm not. thankful for that. Yeah, no, for sure. Although as we were talking earlier, I've spent the entirety of this year sober, uh, and it so far so good. It's been uh, an interesting experience, mostly because I've been sick, but you've been chugging the NyQuil bottle, right? So, I mean, that's sort of alcoholic. Actually, you know what? Honestly, I only had NyQuil for a couple nights and I can't, that stuff just, do you take it from the bottle or the capsules? Like I know I take the little, I like to pour the shooter, the shot glass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The problem that I have with NyQuil is that it's supposed to knock you out. I yeah. think it does the opposite to me. I get wired and I can't sleep. Yeah. I, I, uh, it, it works with me, but my wife loves it and she'll just take it straight from the bottom. Oh. Like she'll take a swig if she needs it. Yeah. But yeah, it, it's, a. Uh, it's been interesting. Like I, I'm kind of on this low level sore throat, cough, cold kind of annoyance where in the morning I feel a little sore. Yeah. I'm fine for the whole day. And then in the evening, like before bed, it starts kind of creeping back in a little bit, but it's just that annoyance factor. It's like, yeah. well, do I need to take NyQuil? It's like, I don't know how much of it's actual placebo versus it's actually helping. Cause I don't know how much help it's done. Well, I, I think most of it too. It's like acetaminophen and most of it is that's kind of what helps. I think. Um, yeah. Just the, the, and I'll only take like, I had a, I had a legit 102 degree fever for two days two and a half days so it made sense yeah right? and to break the fever yeah yeah it, exactly but other than that i just live off been living off gatorade yeah the, the electrolytes yeah that and back. then i just said well I mean, might as well just keep it going yeah so we'll so far so good yeah so far so good we'll see how this goes yeah. before i break down and it, it is not that we should you know I'm, I'm not an alcoholic or anything but man i could use a drink <laughs> It's been that kind of year, huh? Yeah, yeah, already, and it's <laughs> already. Yeah, we're just getting started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other uh, adult thing I've I've been trying to shop for has been a a, a garage door. Now, yeah, yeah, you were mentioning. Yeah, it's not really an exciting thing. It's just our house um, was built in the late '90s, so it was built in like '97. So it's not really it's pretty old. Yeah. yeah, it's somewhat modern. Um, but the garage door is original, and the previous homeowner, we assume, at some point had hung on the sectional door when it was open. Yeah. So they kinked the top panel of the door and they braced it with a two by four. And so over the years, the the door has continued to wear. And so the the upper panel has kinked enough so that depending on, I guess, the, the temperature right. and the time of day, when you open the garage door, sometimes there's enough resistance there with that kinked panel that the motor can't pull it all the way open. So the door just stops halfway. So I physically have to, push the door to get it to open all the way up. Totally minor, not any major inconvenience because we don't park our cars in the garage because that's where all my son's go-karts and bikes and toys are. So it's not that big of a deal, but we're like, all right, we'll start looking at garage doors. And because I live in a city that has a, I guess a community association, there are architectural guidelines. And so it's, a, it's basically you live in a planned community. Yes. Yeah. I live in a master plan community. So yep. there are rules that say, you know, you can't live in a motorhome parked on the street kind of thing. Yep. Um, and so I looked at the rules for architecture. And so they have things like if you're going to change your landscaping, you have to submit plans. If you're going to put a new fence in, uh, your paint colors have to be from these approved color palettes. But on garage doors, they don't say anything. So I'm like, all right, that's good, but bad because... 
there's questions that have to be asked. Right. And so I, I went down to the office and they're like, oh yeah, you have to submit uh, a proposal for the architectural review committee. I'm like, it's just a garage door. It's just, instead of looking like the current one, it's going to look different. And the current door has raised panels. It's a generic uh, sectional garage yeah. door opener. And we want to do more of a contemporary door. So now I got to get the neighbors to sign off on it and do all stuff. But the, the challenge is, is finding, you can't, walk into a store and browse garage door styles that doesn't really exist i mean yeah home depot and lowe's have some displays i'll bet you there's a garage door store but there's not and that's the thing is so i started calling around and so i had uh some companies come out and give me quotes and one of them actually wanted to charge me a visit to come out to give me an estimate i was like what yeah why would i pay you 30 bucks to give me an estimate when all your competitors aren't charging me right so that's that's the uh, the adult grown up thing, but the they come out with like a big book of patterns and stuff. But they're like they there there are several different brands, and it, to me, it's almost like shopping for mattresses. I'm pretty sure there's only like two factories that make these garage yeah. doors, but yeah. they're sub branded under all these different brands, so you can't really cross shop them because um, the styles are all the same. And we're not doing any of the dumb windows. Like I don't need additional daylight in my garage door when it's closed. We don't have. You? I have lights in the ceiling. Like I can flip a switch and illuminate my garage. Okay. So I don't need the little door lights or the door windows. Um, so it kind of reduces the need for all these custom options. But the, uh, the interesting thing is it, in California, I guess sometime last year, they, they passed a, a law and they changed the requirement. But if you wanted to replace your garage door opener, the motor that actually opens the garage door, all new garage door openers must have a backup battery inside so that way you can open the garage door when the power is out. Which makes Except no sense. You, yeah, exactly. It makes no sense because you right. can always just pull the, the, the lock release off the, uh, the track but, and then lift the door up physically. But to your comment earlier, people are stupid. Yes. So now that ties into if you replace the garage door and your garage door opener doesn't have the backup battery, you also have to replace the opener at the same time. How do they know? I guess... The, the way it is, I guess it's, it's almost like, um, you know how when you go into like a, like when they try to catch an, an underage alcohol sales, yeah. they have plain clothes people come in and try to buy liquor from a liquor store that are underage. So they've got plain clothes garage salesmen? No, they got plain clothes customers coming in, getting quotes. And if the garage door technician doesn't tell them they can be fined, and apparently it's a thousand dollar fine for the technician for not installing a garage door with the, the new, or uh, not installing a new garage door opener with a new garage door. I'm so glad those are the things that we spend our time on. Yeah. But anyway, so I mean, we knew we needed a door. Yeah. It's, it's not a critical thing and we have total time because the door still works. But now it's just kind of jumping through all these hoops and it's like deciding, okay, well, I can spend $2,500. I can spend three grand. Right. There was one door that we really liked that had a, um, it was a metal door that was faced with wood and the, the wood was kind of arranged like in horizontal planks. Sure. But it would have been a $5,000 door. And I don't need a $5,000 garage door. So I don't know that anybody does. Maybe, you know, some of those big Hollywood Hills yeah, houses maybe. or something like that. So speaking of this is actually pretty funny that you bring up garage doors. We recently discovered that my mom's, so my mom's place, there's a two car garage and then like a single car garage yeah. door next to it. Right. We recently discovered that the last time the garage doors were off and I can't remember why they had been taken off yeah they were put back on wrong so the top panel is now the bottom panel and it is it's pretty funny you it's the thing where you can't really notice it until you notice it and then once you notice it that's you all can't you ever, see yeah yeah and i'm like well no you have to take the whole thing apart and put it back together and my sister, no, i'll just put a board here and i'm like no 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 you have to take it apart and put it back together because it doesn't make sense otherwise right it's like well nobody will know if i just do this i'm like i'll know and it, it's just... You put a sign in the front yard. Look at my yeah. messed up garage door. Yeah, I mean, no, it, they live on a cul-de-sac that nobody ever goes down anyways, but it's still pretty funny. Yeah. the uh, One of the garage door guys that came to my neighborhood pointed out the same thing about a neighbor's garage door that I never noticed. Yeah. And there's different panel designs, I guess. And this neighbor happens to have... So a sectional garage door usually has four or five sections. Right. Our neighbor has four sections. And so there's four horizontal panels. The two lower panels have a different design than the two upper panels. It's a basically mixed and matched. And oh, it made weird. No reason as to why they did it. Yeah. And then they bolted on a bunch of fake 
hinges. Nice. To make it look like it's got iron yeah, yeah. hinges and handles. And Classy it's like, look. yeah, it, it's, it's like, it's the equivalent of people going to like AutoZone and getting the, the stick on chrome fender vents right. for a car that doesn't actually have them. Maybe they had planned on putting a moat and they needed that aesthetic. Yeah. Like yeah. castle. So anyway, so that's, that's the, uh, those are the two grown up shopping attempts I've made. The, the body jewelry. The 2020 the is crazy so far. Oh yeah. I'm just shopping for everything. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. I have done no shopping this year. Actually, that's not true. I did go, I did go to the Lego store. Yes. But I, I went and I went on the first. I, did I go on the first? Yeah. I, you went on the first. You yeah, sent me a like message. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, Popped in. It was insanely busy. But you were at South Coast Plaza. Yeah, right? I was. Which and I, is already hell on earth. Right. And it was even worse because that it, there's a bunch of restaurants stuff right there. For those that don't know, South Coast Plaza <laughs> is a, I don't want to say a boutique shopping mall, but it's it's a mall with very high-end uh, stores inside. So there's a Rolex store, there's a Louis Vuitton store and things like that. That's all contained to one side of the mall, but it also happens to be the side of the mall the Lego stores are. Right. And they actually have tour buses full of international visitors that they bus in to do shopping in Southern California. Did you know it used to be at one point it was the largest shopping mall in the United States? Before the Mall of America opened up. Yeah. yeah. In terms of, I think, of sales or something like that. I mean, they do... I think the mall does like a billion dollars. I think physical like, square footage at one point, it was the largest in indoor mall. So this mall is already kind of an attraction on its own. Right. And then with the, I guess, holidays and all that stuff, the Lego store and the mall stuff was packed. So it was crazy packed. Um, I went and I wanted to find the new, so the new speed champion cars are the new wider design. They're wider and longer. And uh, there's actually one sitting in front of Matthew, a, next to the old Porsche and I don't love them. Yeah. It, it's interesting. So the, the new sets. So the one thing my son wanted for, for Christmas was some new Legos, but yeah. these didn't become available until January of 2020. Right. So he luckily received some gift cards from his, from his relatives. So when they became available, much like you, we went to the Lego store as well. Right. And so we picked up the Nissan GTR, which you have, as well as the Audi Sport, the Sport Quattro. Mm. So they're interesting sets in the fact that they're bigger, they're sort of more detailed, they're heftier, they're, they're, they're kind of... They're significantly heavier. Yeah, they're more impressive, yeah. I guess, when you hold hold them. Right. But they kind of have lost their charm in some ways. And we, Ryan and I were talking, we, we can't really quite figure out why we don't like them quite as much. Like I don't, I don't hate it. I just don't. There's something to charms a great way to put that. There's something about the old designs and the way that they even were constructed, and the build of them that just has this really kind of cool simplicity, almost simplicity. And it's obvious that it's a Lego. It's not trying to be a Hot Wheel or a diecast model. And the newer car, because they're putting more detail into it, almost comes across a little too, uh, like they're trying to be a little too accurate. Right. And it it doesn't really fit kind of the aesthetic or kind of the, that charm that you want out of it. And the build, I gotta be honest with you, there's, there's a lot of underneath, there's a lot of really big chunky pieces. So there's two by four, you know, blocks and there's a lot of like filler filler. Sure. And then there's a tub that, that you get. So the pieces are more kind of Specific, purpose built yeah. rather than, Hey, I'm building a, a really neat car with some interesting technique. And I mean, that's not to say that it's not, good and it's not neat it's just not quite the same what what will be interesting to see is if they introduce some of these new speed champion vehicles that are i guess updates of the existing ones right so like we have some of the older 911 porsche uh lego speed champions and so if they did a new porsche 911 to see where those changes come into play and see if it's just as kind of simple because we don't really have a Apples to apples comparison with the two exact cars, right? But in different series, they they haven't repeated anything yet, so it's it'll be interesting to see what that is like. I think that will be it. it it'll be really cool to get to make that kind of comparison, that one to one comparison. The Ferrari might be the closest, only because maybe I mean, the new Speed Champions, the F8 uh, Tributo, right? But they've had the 488 Ferrari, so I mean Ferraris are similar enough that maybe that could Close be the closest enough. comparison. Yeah, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see. But I think the thing that makes it odd for me is the proportions. The wheels are physically the same size between the old car and the new car. Right. Even though the new car is wider and taller and bigger. And then the minifig, the the character inside 
in the old car is pretty proportioned. Like it, it fits the the scale of the older, smaller cars better. The new car is wider now, so it's it's two studs two people, wider. Yeah, and you can have two minifigures. You next can actually to each fit other. yeah right. two passengers in there, but it also makes it so that the steering wheel isn't centered on the driver anymore. Like in this Nissan, the steering wheel is off to the right. Yeah. So it is kind of interesting, but it's a, it's a, it was a fun build. My, my son built both of them uh, in the same afternoon. I helped him with some of the, uh, the stickers, which there are, I think still too many. There is a substantial amount of stickers. That is so annoying. And I think it's because these are all the speed champions. So they're all race related. So you have the race livery stickers that you need to apply, but it would be nice that they just kind of had, the option of doing a street version of the car where yeah. it is kind of free from all the stickers, but yeah, it is what it is. But that was a, that was kind of an interesting uh, purchase for my son because this is one of the things where, you know, he's got money burning a hole in his, in his pocket. So you had to get out and spend it as much as possible. Well, speaking of purchases, let's do, let's do what they call in the industry, a callback all to right. a different episode. Uh, I think when we were with Tim, we were talking about this, uh, the hot wheels ID and you told me, I would Our buddy Grayson, it. yeah, you said I would never do that, and we all we all questioned it. it. Yeah, said it's ridiculous. And then what happened? My son, with his own gift card money, went out and bought it. Now, the one thing that he, I did see, then he kind of also bought it in a weird place at the Apple Store. Very strange. So we had seen it like at a Target where they had the track set, and the track set was like a hundred eighty bucks. Yeah, and it's got this uh, piece of straight track that has a RFID reader that has Bluetooth and it's a, a piece of straight track. And then it's got six other track pieces in like a loop and it comes with two cars and it's like 180 bucks. Yeah. It's been at clear on clearance at target. Cause nobody bought those things. And they're now down to, I think half price or like $85, which I think is still a little too steep, yeah. but get that, to like 30 and call me. Right. Right. The, the, that Bluetooth RFID enabled straight piece of track is available all by itself. And it comes with two cars. And so we had to go to the Apple store because my uh, my iPhone 10, my battery took a crap. Okay. Like the, the, the with, I think with iOS 12, there's now a battery health function. So you go into the settings, click on battery to tell you what your battery health is. Oh. It'll give you like normal or a percentage. Mine said service. Oh. And so when I click on it, it brings up a browser and it says I need to get my battery replaced. And it's 69 bucks or 65 bucks or whatever at the Apple store. So I made an appointment, went in. And while we were waiting on my phone after we dropped it off with the uh, the genius bar dude, whatever, my son was browsing the store and they had a display of the app of the Hot Wheels ID stuff. And there they had just the straightaway piece of track mm-hmm. that had the RFID Bluetooth and it was thirty nine bucks, thirty five bucks, something like that. Just the track, no car, no with two cars. Oh, with two cars, okay. But it didn't have the the bank turns of the loop to loop. The stuff that my son doesn't really care about. But all that stuff probably is compatible with, with the existing regular tracks, yeah, exactly. right? Which okay. we already have. Right. So he had a fifty dollars gift card. So he picked that up, and he picked up a uh, what did he pick up? The I think it was the Pagani, Pagani Wira. So they had other cars there. They had other right? cars there. So he picked up one car and that. And what sold them on it was they had iPads available right next to the the display, and they showed you how you could take this this physical car, put it on that piece of track. It would read the RFID tag, and it would unlock that same car in the virtual gaming experience in the app. And my son's all about racing games and stuff, so he plays Forza and and all these other. He's got. Dirt, he's got Forza Horizon, he's got Forza Motorsports, he's got The Crew. Anything with video game and racing on Xbox, he has it. Right. So with his iPad, same thing. He's got a bunch of drifting games and a bunch of racing games. And so he now has that um, Hot Wheels ID game. And so he's more about collecting the cool physical Hot Wheel, not really playing with it, but then playing with it virtually in the iPad game. I don't see the value in it. Yeah, I don't get it, but okay. And the interesting thing is when you look at the game, it has all that same uh, pay-to-play thing. So you can buy virtual currency to buy these virtual cars. And I'm like, I, I told him, I'm like, I'll download the app. You bought the set with your own right. Christmas money. That's totally fine. I'm like, I'm not buying you virtual currency to buy virtual cars because you can still play the games and earn the currency on your own. <laughs> so, but if he buys other cars, Physical cars. then he can unlock, or as long as they're... The ID, the ID cars. cars, right? So it's basically like, and we we kind of talked about the amiibo thing. 
So it's basically like the old the Nintendo character, the figurines or right. figures or whatever, and that unlocks stuff in the games. It's it's essentially that, but with cars. Yes. So we had talked about, oh, we don't even know if that's around or anything. And I actually flipped on my Switch the other day, and sure enough, it's still a thing. Really? Yeah. I was uh, in <coughs> Smash Brothers. There's an option in the menus to get to do the amiibos, and I don't. How you know. do you connect I, it to your? I Switch? think you have to have a the reader thing. There's or? a reader, yeah. That's like one of those, you know, like a. I don't know what it is. It's probably RFID or something. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I, whatever. Yeah. But it, yeah, you have to have one of those. I don't have one. Yeah, because I'm a grown adult. We'll just yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it's about being a grown adult. I just that's not anything I I care about. Yeah, so as much as I didn't want to buy it for my son, I, and I didn't, he went out and bought it. And so far, he's he's been having fun with it. Yeah. Is he like, okay, let's go try and find another car? No, but he does, like, you know, a, a big thing of our, our shopping trips when we go to the grocery store and we go to Target a lot of times is to browse the Hot Wheels selection. So he does include those new Hot Wheels ID in his uh, cursory glances as he checks the aisles. Um, but he hasn't picked any up since. Um, and I, I think part of that has to do with the fact that it's, it's more expensive. It's, yeah, how much are they? I think regular price, it's like six ninety nine or something like that, five ninety nine. So six, seven bucks for a single car yeah. versus he could get six regular Hot Wheels for that price because yeah. they're $0.99 cents a piece. So he hasn't really gotten, got, gotten into it to the point where he wants to spend his money on that. And he still has um, Christmas money left over. No. So there's always the opportunity, but I think part of it is just he hasn't seen anything that he really wants to own. That's that's kind of where he's at with it. So we'll see. And I I haven't really seen, I haven't played the game to really understand the mechanics of it all. Yeah. Like I don't know if you can personalize the cars. Like if you earn enough points, you can make your car faster or do something. Right, right, right. Or if it's just a matter of earning currency just to buy new cars for your virtual garage or collect car. fake Hot Wheels in a fake world. Pretty much. Yeah. And then when Mattel stops supporting the app you no longer have your fake cars. And that well, that's fake the world. thing. If it, you know, it's like Forza, right? Okay. Forza is probably going to be around and there's going to be plenty yeah. of, you know, you, you do collect cars in Forza and you get a garage with 200 or whatever yeah. it is. But the second that this ID, the Hot Wheel ID thing, they if it fizzles out or something, yeah, yeah. they said, Oh, that, you know, the kids don't want it, but it is interesting. We talked about this before a little bit was, the amount of effort manufacturers are putting in to figure out, you know, kids don't want to play with physical toys anymore. So how are you getting them to, to engage with something and play with something and then buy, I mean, spend the money to be honest with you. Yeah. Cause when I look back at what, what Grayson got for Christmas, he got an erector set. He got, um, uh, some smaller Lego sets that he didn't have. Um, how did he feel about an erector set? He was, was there any excitement or was it just like, it's a thing? Yeah, it was more like it's a thing. He, yeah. he started playing with it and started building it. But I think the like we, we built a, a crane, and when it was all said and done, he wasn't all that impressed with it just because of how fiddly it was. Sure. Right? Like the, the crane relied on a bunch of pulleys and string to, to move the crane arm up and down and the hook up and down. Right. Well, as he carries the crane up to his room, the string gets off the pulleys and gets off track. And it's kind of a challenge for a nine-year-old to properly weave that thread where it needs to be to properly operate the pulleys and stuff. So if it was a Lego crane, he wouldn't have had that problem because it would have been physical gears interacting with each other. If it was a Technic set or a little motor or something like that. So it, it does definitely seem to be a little bit more delicate and a little bit more overly detailed that he doesn't really appreciate as much. Like it's cool. He's like, yeah, it's a cool crane, but then he looks at like his, his um, uh, e-boost, or was it? Yeah, the 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 Lego boost uh, robot that he built that has uh, motors and oh, can be cool. programmed and stuff like yeah. that. And that's way more robust. He can manhandle it and tow it around without worrying about it falling apart or falling out of alignment. So the crane right now is just kind of hanging out on a uh, on a case that he has in his in his room. So it's kind of like a shelf trophy at this point. Yeah, I, I don't know. We've talked about it, actually. I think my a big part of 
a rector set for me was just probably the memories, to be honest with you. I think if I played with it now, it would not be anywhere near as interesting. Yeah, I, I think the, the biggest missed opportunity with the rector set is the fact that the tools that they give you to build the set is just such Oh, crap. they were garbage back then, too. Yeah, they it's like, I mean, they're, garbage. they're Allen, and the tolerance for the Allen wrench and the actual Allen head had so much slop in it right. that, that it was frustrating it's to the point where I actually grabbed my own tools just to have a better fitting Allen uh, wrench experience. I remember they had this. Do you remember the open end wrenches that came with them? They yeah. were like, they actually, I think now they give them to you in Ikea furniture. Pretty like much. It was pretty much it's, that same it's stamped metal. Yeah, yeah. Total garbage. And then the, uh, the, <clears throat> the nuts are rectangular head. Right. So the wrench just has like a, a, a actual square notch in the center of it. And then it has two ends that you can grasp onto the nut. Right. But again, there's a ton of play on it and stuff like that. So it's just, the other thing I think is interesting was you don't know how tight you're supposed to tighten stuff. Uh, right. They, they don't. I mean, tight. But with, with Lego, there's no question. It, it snaps together. Right. If there's no gap, you know, you're, you're fully seated. You're right. good to go. With the erector set, you're like, okay, is it snug? Is it tight? And at some points we had tightened, but then it made assembly of later parts difficult because stuff was too tight and you couldn't move stuff around. So then you had to kind of go back oh, like and loosen it and, and loosen certain it, right. stuff to get stuff to align. Right. And the instructions were just garbage. Where like, is a rector set made? Like, is that, is it from another country? You know, I don't know. Probably. But it's, it's, it's interesting because I think it's Meccano is the, the. Yeah. Me- Me- M-E-C-C-A-N-O. Yeah. Meccano, Meccano. But it's interesting because when you look at the the drawings and stuff, like the the set was designed for ten ages ten and up, so it's a little older than my son. He's nine, but not like a huge difference. Right. But in looking at the illustrations and stuff for the for the assembly instructions, it's they they render really odd angles that make it very hard to see where the bolt is supposed to pass through the erector bracket and where the nut goes and how you align stuff. Yeah, and then randomly. Because it's it's computer uh, renderings for for the assembly instructions. Randomly, the parts colors will just change. Like it, it's been a gray part for the first four pages, and also the part changes to orange, and then it goes back to gray. Like it's just the, the inconsistent. The QA of yeah. the whole thing is, is pretty poor compared to a Lego product where there isn't really ever any confusion on how something gets assembled. Like it's it's really clearly laid out. They break it down simply, and with the the Lego app you kind of have the ability to kind of zoom in and kind of get a better glance. Le- what- Lego's instructions are not infallible though. Like I've the- definitely found mistakes and, and some issues and there's some times it's hard to tell what the hell's going on. Right. But that's kind of more of the exception than the rule. Right, Whereas right. with that the director set the with this crane, it was like every other page I was looking at and I couldn't figure it out. And sometimes I'd have to build what I thought they wanted right. only to realize that I had, I misunderstood because I couldn't get to the next step and I had to go back and, disassemble different parts. It's like a really frustrating puzzle. It is a frustrating puzzle, but it's one of those puzzles that it's kind of glued together when you're done. You're like, right. okay, I'm everything's tight. I'm not taking this thing apart. It's done. So night, I did not know this, but Alfred Carlton Gilbert. A household sta- name. Started, yeah, very much so. Started Misto Manufacturing Company of New Haven, Connecticut in 1913. And that's when Erector started until 2000 when it was bought by Mechanel. And they are out of Liverpool. Uh-huh. Because it only makes sense that the British would have bought that crap. <laughs> that explains the electronics, too. Though they have electronics. Yeah, because it's, it's motorized. It's got, a, it's got a battery pack, and it's got some little motors cause to, uh-huh. to move the crane up and down. And the battery pack, you have to assemble. Got it's, it. It's literally like, I think, six separate pieces to assemble a plastic case to hold two... Double A batteries. Like, it's just, really, you couldn't have just molded it out of one piece? Like, you had to make nuts and bolts to assemble this battery case? Well, that's got to be part of the experience. But why? I don't know. That's it. Yeah, so you're looking at it, you're like, okay, I guess. It looks like Mechano actually made, basically, like, a their own version. Yeah. Sort of, of a Rector set, right? And then they ended up, and then bought a Rector. So, basically, almost like a, a competitor kind of doing its thing, and then... When the, when the opportunity came along and bought the competition and took it over. Yeah, or something. They were at least making something very similar. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was, that was you know, everything else for my son received was a lot of clothes. Like my, my uh, parents, for whatever reason, his grandparents like to get him just clothing. Which 
Dude, He's so, okay with. so talking about stuff that, you know, they're trying to get these kids to play these games and there is a certain level of just absolute unnecessary behind some of this automation and things. Have you played Electronic Battleship? No. Okay, so my nephew got Electronic Battleship for Christmas. Is it with physical battleship boards that you sit across? So it? it's basically somebody took the original battleship like, like we played as kids. Yeah. Added a, and I, I'm going to use computer very loosely. They added this computerized element to it. So you turn it on and then you have these kind of fixed boards and you, you pick a fixed board and you program the stupid thing to, to, to this is the configuration, right, right? That I've chosen. The other person chooses their configuration. And then you have to meticulously I want to do uh, A7, right? Right. So I have to type in A7 and then hit fire, and then it tells me if I hit you or not. Uh, and, then, and then you can play an advanced version of that where I can have, like, uh, torpedoes and things. Huh. Dude, it, 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 it's a case of not leaving well enough alone and trying to add an element that just flat doesn't need to be there. It does prevent cheating though. Cause you could always be like, Oh, you no, it doesn't. missed my ship. And then you physically move the ship. Right. I, it's, it's well, I re- guess, but because, because of the, the way it's reading like if you put the wrong thing in or you can't like actually understand the configuration, where the stuff's supposed to go. Yeah. You're in that same, it's still going to miss and it. Oh, you didn't hit me. And then they have, so there's only one, one boat, I think. There's a boat, uh, two airplanes stuck together, three airplanes stuck together, a tank. Because that makes sense in the ocean. Right. That's the one that I absolutely was puzzled over. And uh, something else. But yeah, Electronic Battleship is garbage. Huh. I have been playing a lot of Electronic Connect 4. And it's literally just an app on my phone. Because like, oh, okay. when we go somewhere and we're waiting in line or something and we're kind of getting bored, we just whip yeah. that out. My son and I play back and forth. And that, see, that that makes sense. But Battleship was one of those things where you didn't, you don't need it. So but we ended up just turning it off and just playing, playing manually. Yeah. yeah. Although I did, and I didn't know this ever until recently. You know, there's blue. So there's white pins and red pins. Yeah. Hit, or hits and misses, misses right? right? Right. You know, there's blue pins. No. So... There's blue pins, and I had always seen them in the battleship sets we had as kids growing up, but I could never use them. Yeah. I didn't know what they were for. It's so that when you've hit and sunk a boat, you put a blue one in so you know you don't have to mess with it anymore. But wouldn't you have all the pins I, in it? I, I, I'm just Yeah, that's weird. At a glance, I guess. That's what I was told it was for. If I'm wrong, somebody is free to correct me, but that's what uh, I want to say my sister told me that. Have you ever played other games as an adult when you realize you've been playing the game entirely wrong as a kid? Mm, like, no, I don't think so. Like, I've played shuffleboard as a kid and then realized how you're actually supposed to play it as an adult. And it's like... Uh, like bar shuffleboard? Well, or just literally like old cruise folks, ship, cruise yeah, ship yeah, shuffleboard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't think I ever knew how to play cruise ship shuffleboard. Uh, you just push it and screw around. Yeah, but I have a score. It's like Or like playing darts. Like mm. for the longest time, like, I didn't know how to keep score. So I was just, you know, you throw the dart right. and you're like, oh, bullseye, cool. But all the different ways of keeping score yeah. and how the different games can be played. Croquet. We played croquet the other yeah. day. And I actually looked up how to play it. it I, I don't even know what the rules are. You, I still don't quite understand, but you basically start on one end. You lay out a course. Yeah. You start on one end and you have to go through all the gates in order to get to the other side of the course. And then you turn around and come back. And the first person back with the fewest yeah, strokes? Yeah, like wins. I don't know. I don't think you count strokes. You get points for going through the gate. And then if you get through the little wicket thingy. And, but the, there was, I don't know. There's some extra pieces I don't really understand. My favorite part of okay was just whacking that yeah. ball as hard as possible. Yeah. And I did, We you do need a pretty good lawn because we were playing on sort of thicker grass and it was. It slowed the ball down. So you, Yeah. And then there's, you know, divots and stuff, right? So it wasn't quite. It was pretty funny because it was my my brother in law, myself, and then uh, the two kids, and we were playing, and pretty much everybody gave up about halfway through. They just wish they had a game of lawn darts available. I'm telling you, that is one of my favorite games still. Lawn darts. Yeah, a friend of mine in uh, Washington has. They have a couple sets of them. I'm surprised they couldn't make some sort of like safer like bean. They do. Bag. They have safe ones, but they're like bean bag? round. No, they're oh. just like round tip. Stupid. Yeah, because, I mean, you could do the same thing with a beanbag. Because the whole thing is you just want to be able to have the target stay, once it hits the ground, stay in its position. Yeah, and then there's that weight aspect to it. Right, right. So, like, a a weighted beanbag 
dart would kind of work. Yeah. And if you get it heavy enough, I could you know, beanbag long darts. No, I just want to see if if there's a maybe there's a new version of it. Lawn darts? No, there is not. Pla- they're percent. plastic. Yeah, they, I mean, <coughs> they do have a, a version of it now, and it's all you're right. It's a plastic with a really heavy head on it, and that's all. Yeah, that's so not it nearly doesn't, as fun. It's got a bounce. Yeah, you, yeah. I don't think you would want that, but no, I guess no, you'd no, play no. it on any surface. So if you lived in like in a place with a, a small yard you can play it on the driveway or something like that if it's just plastic but i guess it's just definitely not the same the the original ones with the actual spikes i mean those things would wing that at your buddy and that's a problem we we did throw them at each other sometimes so when we were uh when we had uh, tim on we were talking about the tv shows like on hulu what was it the toys that made us oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so i got onto another hulu series um just recently and it's James May, Our Man in Japan. So this is on Hulu. This is no, this is on Amazon Prime. On Amazon Prime, okay, on, okay. But another streaming yeah, uh, yeah, content yeah. source. So this one's been interesting because my my son and I are, are big Grand Tour Top Gear fans, and James May was a part of the original uh, Top Gear, and he's now on the Grand Tour on Amazon. And in this series, he goes to Japan, and it's kind of like the Anthony Bourdain type of traveling episode, but. Instead of just being a single episode, it's the entire series. So I think it's something like six episodes or something like that. It's a pretty good six series, or eight. yeah. Yeah. And he travels all throughout Japan. And the way it started out is he started off in northernmost Japan. So he was on the uh, island of Hokkaido mm-hmm. before going on to the main island. And he's working his way from north to south. And so we just finished the third episode. So the first episode was Hokkaido. Second episode was the Tendo region. And the third episode was Tokyo. And it's interesting... It, in his approach to it, because he's he's kind of James May is an interesting character. He's always about kind of like the nuts and bolts of things and the 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 stories. But instead of doing like all the stuff you kind of expect, he ends up talking to people that are kind of a little more off the beaten path. And he uh, he went to a, a craftsman's uh, shop. And he makes samurai swords. Oh, that's and cool. The process. The guy was seventy years old, and he has an apprentice. And it takes 10 years for the apprentice to pick up all of the skills necessary to be a master samurai sword craftsman. And it takes, at least according to this uh, to this master, a year and a half to make a samurai sword. And it's all done with the same single piece of steel. Right. But just how it's worked and stuff. And just seeing the the process and just the interactions that he has with the people and, and the interpreters and stuff, it, it's... There was they shed light on some sports I never knew of. Like there was actually a snowballing as a sport, like teams playing against each other with obstacles. It's, imagine like paint snowball fight. Yes. Oh, awesome! Imagine paintballing. So you yeah, have headgear, body protection, but you're playing with regulated size snowballs, and I think you're limited to like ninety, and they're all the same exact density and, and size. And teams line up. There's small obstacles that you can hide behind. And it's the best of three. That sounds awesome. But the, the series is fascinating. I mean, I've, I've been to Japan for many, many reasons, uh, for, for business and for pleasure, but many times. Yeah. And so it, it's interesting seeing other parts of the country being shown off and kind of interesting. And it's, it's been a, a pretty damn good series. Uh, did, you, did you ever see his show called, um, oh, what's it called? Toy Stories? I've, I've seen an episode. I've seen parts of an episode. That was also a really cool show where he would go and they'd have like, so artifacts or air, air, air effects, art, air effects, air fix. That's what it was called. So air fix is a model company. Okay. And they would make like, they made this life size air fix spitfire model where he had all the pieces built and everything. Um, they did one about uh, Mechano actually, where he built a bridge out of Mechano. But so they would do these, like he would go explore histories behind these toys and then make them, life size like he would make actual full scale i know he built a lego house a full-size house yeah, he, out of lego. one of them was a lego house um so it was, it, that was a really cool show too uh but, but modern shows on disney plus uh jeff goldblum has a show called uh the world according to jeff goldblum another fascinating show and he's just a fascinating dude jeff he's is- a super interesting dude but he's a thing where his show isn't a, a singular topic it's I think it's 30 minutes and every whatever week they have yeah. a, new, a new topic, but they've done sneakers, denim. Uh, he did ice cream. So he goes and explores these 
different topics and learns more about them. Like the sneaker one was fascinating. They the, go the sneaker heads that collect. And yeah, he goes and talks to them. He goes to Asics and learns about uh, you know kind of how they design sneakers and how they're making them more uh, runners more efficient and better for athletes. And huh. they've got dude. There's one scene. Just it's an absolute riot. They have this. They call it a strike plate. Right. And so, you know, you run across it and it shows how your foot strikes and it's, they can help design the sole of the shoe to be more supportive right. or whatever. So you run across it barefoot? <laughs> no, you run across it in a shoe, oh, okay. but they've got Goldblum doing it. And Jeff Goldblum's run is, I don't want to ruin this for everybody because you need to, it's worth watching. Is it like an ostrich? He does this weird like little. Saunter? Kind of like, kind of like a bop. Huh. They, they keep calling it a bop. And yeah. it is. Is hilarious, yeah, but the whole show is fascinating. Yeah, I was at a uh, Cars and Coffee, uh, I and mean, I go quite regularly with my yeah. son. But it was sometime over the summer, and he was actually there. He was filming uh, an episode, and I, I'm assuming it had something to do with car culture or yes. Yeah, so that that episode just came out, uh, I think, this week. I haven't watched it yet. Yeah, you have to let me know how it is. Yeah, and it looks see, it looks pretty good. And see if you see my huge head somewhere <laughs> in the background. Well, with the amount of people that they've got in the background of things, I may not see you at all. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Is he, like, in the episodes you've seen, are there just huge crowds of people when he's out and about in public, or is it? There's actually not, it's not, like, annoying, and, and he'll be, like, kind of standing just in one spot, and there's people walking by him, and okay. there's nobody really irritatingly stopped, or nobody really kind of doing anything stupid. It's pretty, huh. you know, pretty, but it, like, his cadence and the way he talks about stuff, and he's almost got this, like... He did kind of childlike fascination with some of the stuff. That's he really did an interview with Conan O'Brien on uh, Conan O'Brien's podcast. Conan, okay. Conan needs a friend. Yeah. And it was just hilarious. Cause he had Jeff Goldblum is a jazz musician. Yes. So he has, he does have a jazz band. And so they were, they got into this topic and then Jeff kind of like lowers his voice and tries to talk a little bit more sultry. Right. And then it's just Jeff and Conan just kind of groaning and moaning back at each other. <laughs> it sounds really odd. But it was hilarious. I can see that. And it's only, you know, the, I think the the Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend podcast are only about like 50 minutes or an hour. Right. But if you get a chance, take a listen to the Jeff Goldblum episode. It was it was well done. And it gives you a little bit more of, I guess, respect for the man. He's an interesting, interesting dude. Oh, he's super interesting. And I, I, I've really enjoyed the show. Which is interesting because when you think about Jeff Goldblum, like I, I don't know of anything recently that he's done. Like, I mean, he's kind of like a, a, a pop culture phenomenon. I mean, yeah. you, you know him from movies that we kind of grew up with, like, I mean, Jurassic Park and things of that nature. But I don't know what the latest thing he's done other than this than this uh, new series on Disney+. Plus. Yeah, I have no idea. But he, yet he's still a, a presence. Like, people know who he is. Well, and, the, the, and to that point, that he does an episode on tattoos, and they go to this, like, his hometown has a Jeff Goldblum festival thing and there's people that line up to get Jeff Goldblum tattoos and he shows up and ends up tattooing one of the guys. No. <laughs> yeah. Like he, I think he does like two lines or something, yeah. right? But the guy's like, yeah, go for it. And like tattoos part of, so Jeff Goldblum tattoos part of a Jeff Goldblum tattoo oh, no onto some guy. That's like inception. That's super weird. That is weird. But yeah, he's, he's just a super like this weird cult figure. And to your point, I don't know what he's been in. Yeah. And he's got a like a four year old. Yeah, yeah, I remember seeing something like that. Yeah, something I think. Yeah, I I follow him on Instagram. Okay. Just because he's such an interesting yeah, dude, yeah, and, yeah. His, and his fashion taste is kind of interesting, and he's he's got some swagger, and it's just it's kind of hard not to admire a dude like that. Yeah. Like he's kind of an ungrown up. I mean, the way he carries yeah. himself and his personality and how he saunters about life, it's uh, it's not a bad place I, to be. I think he's super interesting, and I like I said, I think his out outlook on stuff and the way that he approaches things and is like he's genuinely interested in what these people are saying yeah it's like do you remember uh, california gold yeah okay Hugh hauser for those of you that have no idea what i'm talking he was on about public access public access california show this guy would it was called california gold and Hugh hauser would go to all of these interesting sites and interesting places in california and he would talk to the people yeah but he will always came across as a dick like he just had this kind of sarcastic, like somebody you know, would ask a question about, Oh, you know, tell me about this. And be like, well, this is the door to the house, the original door to the house, the original door, like the way that he yeah. would talk back to the people and like, kind of, I don't think he them. meant it that way, No, no. but it read like, wow, dude, you were a 
dick. Like you are so sarcastic. Goldblum's not like that at all. Huh? It's it. He's genuinely like, oh wow, and very thoughtful about about what's happening, and it's it's a total trip. So and with, then it's delivered as Jeff Goldblum. Right, 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 right. So with these shows being on Disney Plus, are they released once a week? Yeah, they're doing once a week, which I think is awesome. Yeah, it is kind of interesting how because at first when everybody was doing streaming, they just dropped them all at right. once, and everybody would binge watch. And right. I mean, there's pros and cons on both, but it is kind of nice knowing that you can kind of pace yourself and watch here and there. Like we watched the uh, over the holiday break last year, the first uh, episode of the Grand Tour dropped. And in previous years, it'd be an episode a week, but they've right. changed the format. I don't even know when the next episode comes out, but we watched Seaman, Seaman, yeah, yeah, where they had boats and they had to yep. travel through. Uh, yeah, I don't know when the next one comes out either. I don't even know what it's about. Yeah, but I guess they're all, at least for the Grand Tour, they've changed the format. So all they're doing are these big, epic right. tour type right. uh, travels rather than some of these standard, here's a cool car, let's take it around the track kind of thing. So, Well, the, the Mandalorian was once a week. Is that over? Yeah, the last episode. Oh, my God. We could do three shows, four, five, seven shows just about that. I haven't watched this. You need to episode. watch it. Yeah, I know. It's just... It's, I think that's a, the downside with content today. There's just so much out there just to yeah. really be able to watch it all and listen to it all. And It is so good, even just as a TV show. Yeah. Like if you're in, like if you ever watched Firefly, you're into like sci-fi shows and Battlestar and it is, it, I think it's the best Star Wars thing to happen since Return of the Jedi. Would you go back and rewatch the season? Oh, or yeah. have you? No, I will. Okay. Uh, it's on the list, but I mean, it was, it was so well done and they just, they nailed it out of the park. And is it set up? So it's kind of like a TV show format where it's like a half hour. Yeah, it's half. It's about half an hour. 32 ish minutes. I think was the longest episode. It is kind of like a space Western. There are a ton of cameos, um, it, which is both good and bad. There's some people that I honestly kind of could have done without. Actually like celebrity cameos. Like you yeah, recognize, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's like Bill Burr's in an episode. Um, but, and he, but he's got a pretty good line and I don't think this is Bostonians. And yeah, there's a dude, there's an app, there's a line. Somebody, he mentions there. So this happens after return of the Jedi. It's like five years later, okay. or right? Three to five years. And there's this line where somebody says, oh yeah, he was a, an Imperial blah, blah, blah. And he, basically they allude to, you know, how the stormtroopers can't hit anything. Right. And Bill Burr goes, I wasn't a stormtrooper wise ass. But like his delivery, because it's Bill Burr, was really good. There's a scene with Jason Sudeikis that, oh my god, it, it is, it is hilarious. So is because it's on Disney Plus. Is this all like PG content? I mean, I guess I mean Star Wars already is pre, is pretty tame. It's PG thirteen ish. Okay. Um, I mean, there's a lot. Of, a lot of people die. But Star Wars death. I mean, it's not like gruesome. There's a guy who got cut in half. Ah. Oh. And like with episode a one. No. No lightsabers. No lightsabers, really. No, this is post Jedi. Doesn't what does the technology just become in apparently unavailable? Yeah, apparently four hundred four lightsaber not found. Yeah. Um. No, but it's and it's on planets you've never heard of, and it's uh, it's just really cool. And there's a this really neat like Western vibe to the the show, the soundtrack. There's an episode that basically is like, oh man, I'll remember the film later, but it's essentially a you know samurai film. Interesting. Super cool. Yeah, like as it is right now, I mean, we don't watch a ton of TV. Like we'll watch bits and pieces here and there. Like my my son likes uh, Goldberg's and Bob's Burgers and stuff like that. So a lot of stuff yeah. we'll, like that's currently on TV, we'll, we'll yeah. catch through Hulu. Otherwise, it's a Friday night, Saturday night. What's on Netflix or what's on Amazon Prime just to catch you know something. But it's not an all day, every day thing. So mm. it's just as it is. It's like there's already more stuff available than we have time to watch. Well, having been been sick for a while, yeah. Oh my god, I watched. I, That's I what I need slept is a, a good TV. sick day. Yeah, exactly. And just go home and binge watch something and catch up on something. And, but I think I think the other thing is is like culturally. I mean, even though I know a lot of people have watched it, I I don't see like that same level of like water cooler talk. Why? Where, where I feel like I'm missing out because I'm not a part of the conversation. I think what's at least for me, I think what's been interesting is because it's every week and whatnot there's been a lot of people have been really respectful of spoilers, spoilers. Yeah. yeah so it's not I, unless the conversation has been prompted yeah i do like making up fake spoilers though <laughs> like the yoda sex scene or right. you know, the, the car chase or something that's totally not even a part of the movie and you're like what are you talking about yeah but 
that's only because I haven't seen it, so I have no idea. So I know I'm not really risking any right. useful information by saying something stupid. But no, really well done. But uh, the the other thing I got stuck watching uh, was an old season, like four seasons ago or something, of the worst cooks in America. Oh, like the cooking challenges where they just can't. Yeah, it's a whole show about how. You know, here's the 20 worst cooks, and they try and make them better, and I have no idea why. It's yeah, been interesting. we were big on the, uh, I think it's on Netflix, called Nailed It, where they have people oh, yeah, that yeah. think they can bake, and they have like, oh, here's this super elaborate cake that looks just like the Statue of Liberty. Right. You now have two hours to build that cake, and then yeah. it ends up being this green lump of of crispy or of uh, Rice crispy right, Treats. Right. Yeah, those are pretty fun. Those are pretty funny. We did get into something that I think I, it's on Hulu. It's 90 Day Fiance. No, come on. My wife is big on that. And really? it's, it's, it's such a train wreck because these are people, for whatever reason, that have found love in a different country. Right. Or fa- fell in love with somebody from a different country. And it's the struggles of these people. We used to just call it Mail Order Bride. Yes, it kind of is. But it, the first episode, the first season, I think, was all men with brides from overseas. Yeah. The second season was a mix. There were some women that had found men in other countries. Really? And so, yeah, it was a change of pace. But the one thing that's kind of a common thread is all these people that are from the U.S., that are living in the U.S., they're all broken in some way. Like some of them, like they're, oh, yeah, this is going to be my, my fourth wedding, my right. fourth bride, or I'm broke. or you know. And it's yeah. just like, why are you going through this expensive immigration process if you're a barista that can't afford to do anything? It's just... These are train wrecks of people, and, and my wife and I can't figure out why they would willingly share their story on TV. There's a lot of that on, and I don't know if it's human vanity or the need to feel, like, accepted or what it is. Because it's not money. The, no, but no, it can't be. Because we looked it up. The people that get paid, or the, the, the people on the show get paid uh, somewhere around like 1500 bucks an episode. And it's only the person that lives in the U.S. that gets paid because those that come to the U.S. on a K-1 visa can't get paid. Can't get paid. Right. They can't be. Yeah, they're not. They're not able to work in the U.S. So for a full season of what is it, eight episodes or whatever, they get maybe twelve thousand five hundred bucks. Well, and it's it's like it's the same thing as those people that like you know and, like people but, that want to be on cops that legally yeah, sign yeah, the sure. documents to be on cops. It's, but the, but but I was gonna say what I was actually gonna say is that and and I'm glad that they do this because it's effing entertaining to me. But these people that have these fail videos and stuff, like why did you upload that? Yeah, it's that same thing. Like it's that viral mindset. Yeah, that's why? It. There's no reason if I go and I fall down my stairs trying to do some trick and I'm recording it, you know what's going to happen to the recording? It's never going to see Nobody's the light of ever day. Nobody's ever going to yeah. see it. And I think, I wonder if that all started just because of that America's Phone Some video, that, that easy way to make a 10 grand for your, your VHS cassette and that kind of spawned all these other things and now it's turned into viral. I think, I think it's that mentality too of, you know, I've got to be, or I want people to pay attention or I'm not getting enough attention or whatever. I think that's part of it. Yeah. It's just interesting because in watching these, like it's, just, it's the Instagram thing. It's yeah. But in some of these, like the relationships are just so toxic. Yeah. Like there was one, I think this was season four. The, the dude was dealing with marijuana. Like he had like a dispensary or something like that, but he had been in prison and therefore they couldn't really qualify for apartments. And his, his fiance was this, crazy money obsessed Russian girl that was really kind of seemingly into him because he had a bunch of money. Right. And it was such a toxic relationship. Like she keys his car keys idiot on the side of his Escalade. And then a couple episodes later, they're driving to the courthouse in that very same Escalade. that says idiot on the door to get married. And he's just like, what are you doing? What the hell? And so it's such a train wreck. And I don't know why people, I don't know if it's like the, the ability. Okay. I'll then leverage this TV show into becoming an Instagram influencer, oh. or maybe I'll get paid appearances to be somewhere. I think, but it's just well, something about it works because we're talking about it. Yes, but right. I, I I guess the show's been around for years. I never I've came never across it. it until we stumbled upon it on Hulu. Somebody else. It's funny that you bring it up because somebody re- very recently had mentioned the same show to me. Huh. It wasn't you. I don't remember who it was, but I had never heard of it before that. It, I guess the show airs on t- the TLC. 
That is a quality network. It used to be. I mean, back when the, the History Channel was really good and the, and the TLC was really good, then it all became about people with weird medical afflictions. and it's Canadians. Isn't it a Canadian show? Or what? channel? I don't know. I the, the Discovery Channel is, or was. Yeah. Before Disney bought it. Yeah, so that's, that's I don't know. It's just kind of interesting. Like all the stuff that we used to watch for educational purposes yeah. is totally just skewed to entertainment. There's, and questionable entertainment. Oh, God. There are, and the thing is, like, if you look hard enough, there's a lot of those shows. Oh, yeah. Like, there, there's one, my, I don't even remember what it's called, but it's, uh, my sister was watching it, and it's a, uh, it's a reality show, and all of the main characters all have Down syndrome. Huh. And I, can, I feel exploitative watching it. Yeah. It's super weird. And they're all, like, it's just about them and living their lives. Right. And, and, it's, you know, and it's... And they're informative, but at the same time, you're watching you're, someone. It's weird. Yeah. And they've made it where it's like, you can tell that it's a reality show and they're they're feeding a little bit of it. And it's like, I don't know. Like, remember that little people, big world? Yeah. Like that. Like, that's weird to me. Yeah. Reality TV isn't real. Like, I mean, no. I, I worked for a company that was uh, providing automotive interior parts for, what was that show on the Discovery Channel where they had def- Hot, oh man, not pit it, my ride. No, 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 not pit my ride. It was the one with Boyd Coddington. Oh, uh, it was one of those hot not rod overhauling. No, 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 but it was like that type of show. It was one right. of those where it would showcase uh, Boyd Coddington and his crew of guys working on a car and getting it ready by some arbitrary deadline and stuff, right? And I knew it was all fake when the producer, we, we did the thing and then they stopped and had us redo that entire scene again because they didn't get the dialogue that they wanted, right. I'm like, what the hell? Like, when you start feeding the reality stars lines and making them do things a well, certain I think way. That, that was from day one. Yeah. Right. But th- I didn't realize it. You Watching the show, you don't realize it. Right, but right, then when right. you actually see it being filmed in front of you or in your workplace, you're like, oh, that's as fake as hell. Right. I'm, I mean, this is reality. Re- reality podcasting. Yeah. I fed you half this stuff. Yeah, we've done this. This is take 46. <laughs> yeah. And this is as good as it gets. <laughs> yeah. Man, that is really sad. No, <clears throat> there's a lot of that stuff. I mean, it's, it's, if you go now and like look at Hulu or look at, you know, just browse. Oh, yeah. That's what most of this crap is these days. Yeah. It's just, it's terrible. Yeah. And it all seems like, I, I don't know if it's chicken or the egg, but when they had the, the writer's strike the number of years ago, was it like the mid, early 2000s? Mm-hmm. And that kind of turned the table because reality TV is so much cheaper to develop because you don't have people writing scripts. You don't have all that overhead. Mm -hmm. And the profit margins, I guess, are seemingly larger. And I guess it finds an audience. And there's people that that are watching. I mean, we're watching, we've been, uh, we've been going through and binge watching. I mean, I think we're on the fifth season. Yeah. And we started a few weeks ago. So we've been watching a couple episodes here and there throughout the week. So. Well, and I'll, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. Like, yeah. I, you know, I'll watch some of that stuff, but definitely cooking shows over anything else. Oh yeah. For me. The cooking shows are always fun. Cause you look at it and you're like, oh, that looks good. Yeah. Have you ever tried to make something that you saw and it? Like, oh, that sounds good. Or, uh, not well. I mean, yeah, I've made stuff not necessarily off like a cooking competition show, but like, I've made. Oh, prime rib sounds good. I'll try that. Or... Yeah. I, yeah. I, I like cooking a lot. Yeah. So I do. Whether I see it there, or I just have a dumb idea in my head, and then I'll Google something and and verify that it's not the worst idea. And yeah, somebody's <laughs> done it before. Somebody, yeah, or at least something similar. I a lot of times it's I'll look something up and I just make it up myself, for the most part. What's the craziest thing you've made up from a culinary standpoint? Uh, I don't think anything crazy, but like I did the uh, I don't know if I told you about what I did seventy two hour or excuse me forty eight hour. Um, basically sous vide chuck roast for Christmas. And most of that was me. Okay, here's what, you know, I want to do something. And then I had a basic idea, looked up a few like little bits and pieces and then just still pieced together my own recipe. My my best culinary adventures of when I was broke. Yeah. And just had to make a meal out of what was left in the pantry in the fridge. Yeah. That's, I think, where the the real challenge comes into play. Instead of having this virtual grocery store where you can run out to any aisle and get the exact ingredient you want. It's like, all right, I got saltines, I got butter, I got mustard, and I got some ham. What am I putting yeah, together here? You are not ending up with anything good is what you're 
what you're ending up yeah. with. Or not, it, not even great. I not say. even great. Yeah, right. it's edible. It, it's right. it's sustenance, but yeah. it's not something you go. Mm, I'm, I can't wait to make that again. Well, I jump on a plane tomorrow, so I haven't I haven't grocery shopped. So tonight's gonna be like. I think I've got some romaine lettuce and some vinegar. Or you like, just walk down the street and get something to eat. I mean, that's nah, kind of... No, I, nah, I, I want to finish what's here. That's true. Before it goes bad. Yeah, got some zucchini. Nice. Yeah. It's going to get... Whew, it's all, it's all kinds of culinarily crazy. Oh, yeah. You're going to yeah. go out on a limb. Oh, yeah. The... Uh, you know, I but yeah, I, I do like watching a lot. There's a lot of shows that I like make the making shows like where they're making stuff or they're building things. Like I really enjoy that. And I'm yeah. like, always like, Oh yeah. And it inspires me for about 15 minutes. And then I, and it's, I, I think a lot of those shows, like it. I do the same thing where, especially when it's like a automotive or home repair type of show where you look at it and you go, Oh, well I could do that. Or it's like, oh, I, I would probably do something different. Like right. I like what they did, but here's well, how, you, I mean, you get a bit of a germ of an idea. Yeah. It's yeah. the, now you have to do it part. Right. No, no. It's just, it's all that hypothetical in your head. Like, oh, I would have done it this way, even right. though there's no way you're going to do that type of project just because you don't need to or whatever. But right. it is kind of that, it, it gets the, I guess the, the creative ideas going. Right. So yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah. And I do enjoy that part of it. And that, that's kind of cool. And, you know, I have plenty of stuff around here. I can make a ton of stuff. I just don't Yeah. Know. Like my, uh, my son's a big fan of guys, grocery games. I can't, I can't watch that show. I don't. Chef Bro and I will never be friends. <laughs> Ever. He's a he's actually a good guy. He's I've, probably I've a, a great guy. I've had a chance to meet him a couple times. Yeah, he, I, uh, we have several friends in common. He but, needs to calm down. Yeah. But I think part of that is just that's the persona he's created, yeah. so he kind of has to live up to it at this point. Did you see... Uh, Do you ever watch American Dad? Yeah. Did you see the episode with... It was the Guy Fieri episode where it turns out... It turns out Guy Fieri is basically a demon and they have to return him back to like this, this place that's like got like a hot cheese lava lake thing and put him in the lake to get like the demon to get released or, oh my God, it's hilarious. Jeff, Jeff joins the crew. No, I have not seen that episode. I'll have to check that out. It's pretty good. I'll look it up. It's pretty hilarious. I remember early on, uh, when he was just kind of getting started with the diners, drive-ins and dives, like persona. We, I was up in the Northern California. I was at, I think I was in Santa Rosa and he had a restaurant called uh, Tex Wasabi. Yeah. And so it was this weird mashup of like American food and Japanese food. So like you would get a sushi roll that had French fries in it. It was surprisingly good though. Like totally tacky. Like you would look at it and go like, Oh, holy hell. What the hell is it? But when you ate it, you're like, no, it, it actually works. Yeah. From a flavor standpoint, but I like going to those restaurants. Oh yeah, like, like I, I'll, I'll look it up. Yeah. yeah, if I'm in a city and like I went uh, Fairbanks, we went to uh, one of the places he was at Fairbanks or Anchorage, maybe it's Anchorage. Anyways, no, it's I, whatever. It doesn't really matter, does it? It's Fairbanks. We'll no. just call it Fairbanks. But I think the the cool thing I think he does at least with that show is he does shed light on these smaller mom and pop right. establishments that wouldn't have right. the attention otherwise. And it has been pretty cool to be able to eat at some of the spots and, and try those things. And you're like, oh, yeah, th- this is a legit dining spot or dinner spot or whatever it is. There's a really, really good breakfast place in the university area in uh, Seattle uh-huh. that he went to that was pretty awesome. There's a good burger place in Sacramento. Um, yeah, so the, he does go to some decent spots, but they're definitely 90% of them are greasy spoon, like yeah, yeah. heart attack on a plate, which is the best tasting. Oh, yeah, that's where all the flavor is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fat is flavor. Brown food is flavor. Just yeah. remember those things. Yeah, those yeah. those things are not wrong. No, they are, they are totally correct. Ooh, I got bacon. You going to do bacon wrap zucchini? Maybe. Sautéed in some <laughs> God, <that sounds laughs> vinaigrette. that so terrible. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you never know around here, kids. Um, so it is 2020, and this is... This is the third episode that we'll have out in 2020. Yeah. So, ocho. yeah, we are, we're on a roll. You may or may not have noticed and not you specifically, Matthew, but the other people that are listening to this may or may not have noticed that we've, uh, we've got one guest this year. Uh, so far yeah. we, uh, spend some time together and we will have other people back. Don't fear. We, uh, we have, will this not, is just uh, a chance for you to get to know us better. Yeah. I'm, and for these things, we apologize. Yeah. <laughs> we always have to apologize. Yeah, I don't. Oh, God, there's going to be a lot to know. or There is a lot to know, I guess. Um, so actually, speaking of making things really quick, I 
need to make an acrylic uh, display case. So I can't find the size that I want. So I have a, a visor off of one of my motorcycle helmets. Yeah. And I just want the visor in a display. Uh-huh. And it's easy to find a helmet display. I right. have a couple of those. But just the visor. So I've actually got to get some acrylic and cut it up and glue it all together. I have some guys that can do that. Yeah. Yeah. I I uh, I know people. So I have a lot of interesting connections where it's yeah, like, yeah. yeah, either I may not know the person directly, but I know somebody can. Yeah. And years ago, um, I was dating a, a girl that was a pageant contestant, like did beauty pageants, yeah, yeah. stuff like that. And she had won one. And so I had all a, right. Yeah. She wasn't the last placer. Yeah, I don't know what that so, means. So uh, the runner-up or whatever. Yeah. So I had a acrylic case made for her tiara. Oh yeah. yeah so yeah. same thing. It was just yeah. so I I know people. So if you need to do that, and I also had uh, for our wedding, we had an acrylic cake stand made that fit the aesthetic for the wedding. That's cool. So same thing. So like, if you, I I think it's a thing. Like I've built acrylic boxes before. Yeah. It's just a matter of. Figuring out how do I want, you know, what, what how are you going to hold like. the visor up? I'm just going to make basically a acrylic platform. Yeah. Or I should say a base with a slightly smaller platform. And I'll probably just raise it off with some, some standoffs. Okay. And then the visor will sit on that. And then that'll give me the ability. Cause it'll only be a couple mil smaller. Yeah the platform. So then I just build a top that fits over that and that holds yeah, it. I didn't up. know if you were going to take the, the, vow, the visor mounts and incorporate that into your stand. No, so you I thread just, it in and no, just super basic. It'll just sit in there. No, that would be cool. But no, it'll just sit in there. I just want a thing that covers. I can put it on a shelf because it's the visor that, um, I can't wear anymore. Cause it, I took a rock to the face, uh, off a bike in front of me in Alaska. So I'm going to, I'll just, you know, I've got to... Are you going to try to do it so it's modular? So that way, if you have future visors, you can then somehow... No, just... I hadn't even got that far. I didn't think about it. Because, well, I mean, it's one of the things, I mean, yeah, you, you go through all this work to make one. You right. want to make sure it's either reproducible in case you need more. Right, right, right. And then how are you going, you know, how do you incorporate that? But that'll be cool. Yeah, and it's just, uh, you know, because I've got, so I, I have like a silver Sharpie, you know, kind of yeah. right when, where the visors, because that visor is only on that Or trip. you can just get a little a plaque engraved, like any frame shop can do that. Like a little plaque, and like yeah. A trophy I, shop. I kind of like I, I did. Um, I've got a couple helmets and stuff, and they're written on. Okay. And then I, stupidly, I, they become my autograph. You sign your own visors. I did. Don't worry about it. <laughs> One day they'll be collectibles. Yeah, maybe to nobody, but that's okay. No, I just kind of you know it's like m- mementos. Yeah, from yeah. Trips, the, right? the memory. So, the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just wanted to have a thing and just have it kind of. But you could edge it. light the the acrylic with some you LEDs. Could. You could. Go fancy. You probably could. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> the other thing you could possibly do is like check out. Um, I was just in Michael's looking at stuff and they had a, a large number of different cases for like baseballs, golf balls, yeah, basketballs. I, I need to take a visor with me and go to Michael's and, and see, see what the closest got, Yes, yeah, yeah. pre built. Um, it's surprisingly expensive for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Which I, I thought was somewhat surprising. I think the. The helmet that I've got in my the other room, I think that was a hundred and thirty bucks or hundred forty bucks for the yeah. case for it. Yeah, I've got some sports memorabilia at home, so like batting helmets and and football helmets and footballs and basketballs and stuff. And yeah, the cases for those weren't cheap, right? But compared to the cost of the item, it's like ah, uh, it's yeah. negligible. Well, I've got a a uh, signed Blazers basketball, and I don't even remember what year it's from, but it literally has no case. It sits up on top of a you just shelf. Dri- dribble it around from here and there. Yeah. Yeah, it's- Good I basketball. Really I actually, if I f- found a Blazer fan that absolutely loved it, I would hand it to them and never think twice about it. How'd you end up with a autographed Blazer basketball? Uh, when I was uh, living in Portland, we were one of the sponsors for oh okay for Blazers. So we uh, we had tickets and all yeah. That. yeah yeah. Anybody good playing on that team back in the day? No idea. I went <laughs> to a couple games. Can you even read the autograph? Uh, that's always fun. Yeah, when maybe celebrity autographs. You're like, I don't know what even that it says. Yeah. And there's no, I mean, I guess there's no proof, but it was given to me by the Blazers. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of times the players at least will scribble their number on it. So at least that helps you identify. Oh, I'm sure the, it's, you could figure it out yeah. if you really cared. Right. But I just had taken it and stuck it on a shelf and yeah. I am going to have nowhere else to put it. And I, you know, would rather free that space up for other things for Lego. But maybe. Yeah. 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 I see so, it is. Uh, the, the millennium Falcon, I'm trying to convince my buddy has the, the millennium Falcon, you know, it's like three feet long or whatever. I'm trying to convince him, Jason actually, yeah, yeah. 
to buy this coffee table that I saw recently that, that it fits into, but it's so far no go. Yeah, that one's that one's hard when you're married and you have a spouse that's actually concerned about the. Oh, she doesn't care. They have Legos everywhere. Oh, and in fact, they build Legos together. I think it's it's interesting though. I was thinking about this. So all of these, I don't know of a single one of these companies that's not somewhere in like Eastern Europe that make these cases. Yeah. They they make all these display cases for, you know, if, if a brand new Lego set comes out, they've got a display case for it, which is some of them are making little stands and yeah. things. <laughs> right? There's not a single one in the US. Maybe it's just cuz of labor costs. Maybe or maybe there's an opportunity. Hmm. What do you think the the we main business American... ideas on this show? <laughs> yeah. Carbon fiber body jewelry <laughs> and uh, acrylic display cases right. for Random items. Because there are a lot of the people on the internet. Yes. That live in the United States. They can't they're, wait. They're importing these. You know, I mean, how much is shipping? True. Customs. Yeah. So he made them here and they're all flat pack. Oh, really? Yeah. No. Oh. No, they're all flat pack and you get them and then you, they've got like clips to hold them all together. Oh, they're, that's they're not super cool. not. Yeah. Not fancy. No. Hmm. Maybe. Just saying. Uh, you know, laser that, cutter. Yeah. Right. I, I know people with laser cutters. Yeah. yeah. Lasers are everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> Got a laser in my phone. Probably 2020 lasers everywhere. Yeah. This it's, it's crazy. We've predicted this in uh Terminator. Yes. I still don't have my flying car, but well, uh, and we've passed Blade Runner. Yes. Well, in November, I think we passed Blade Runner. Yeah. Right? And we passed the future of back to the future a couple of years back. We did. So. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. Who hmm. knew the future was going to be so bleak? No <laughs> flying cars. It's just, turns out it's just the suburbs still. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it sucks. And, and uh, on that depressing On that note, very depressing note, let's get the hell out of here. All right, Matt, bye. See ya. You've been listening to the Ungrown Ups Podcast, and for this, we apologize. <laughs>